Welcome to Business Talk, where we explore the latest trends and innovation shaping industries across South Africa and beyond. I'm your host, Michael Avery, and today we're kicking the bricks on the dynamic world of property financing. It's a sector where tech is rapidly transforming how banks and financial service providers operate and importantly engage with you and I, with consumers. Joining me is Clive Bredenkamp, a seasoned prop tech IT executive at E4. Clive brings a wealth of experience from working with uh, some of South Africa's top financial service providers, particularly in the home loan space. He's at the forefront of how technology is reshaping the property financing landscape. Clive, really good to have you on the show. And as I said, you, you work with so many FSPs, many of whom offer home loans. Based on this experience, how have consumer expectations shifted in recent years and, and what do you see as causing this? Yeah, so thanks, Michael. Good to be with you this morning. I think off the bat, we, we're in some fascinating times. Um, so we're having this conversation at a, at a very interesting time, I think, in history based on what's happened in the last few years. And if you think about what's been happening, let's say the last six months, we've had load shedding come under control. We don't expect mm -hmm. it to come back or at least if it does, not to the same extent. Um, we've also had some fairly favorable elections. And I say favorable from the sense of a business-friendly election. And so we know that that has a good impact on job creation. You know, government doesn't create jobs. Uh, business creates jobs. Yeah. And then we also see inflation come under control. So another another positive. Um, I have to throw in the spring box are winning. And Drick is still a world <laughs> champ. So that's looking positive. Um but then also we, we have indications of an interest rate cut coming in September. And so there's been a lot of speculation, uh, let's say over the last year about when that cut will come. A lot expected it earlier than it has been. But we're looking at a cut in September, a cut in November, potentially two next year. And I think why that's important, Michael, is we've, we've seen since COVID the a uh, direct impact of the interest rate on consumer sentiment around purchasing, especially with regard to home loans. And so yeah. what we saw in COVID was um, the volumes essentially dried up from a transactional point of view in home loan registrations. And before COVID, we were sitting at roughly a 10.25, 10 10.5% interest rate. And what, what happened was in order to stimulate the economy, the interest rate dropped to 7%. Now, 7%, we'd lost, when I look back in the history of interest rates, we'd lost at a 7% interest rate in 1965. So, wow. so quite radical. And, and so then what happened was the interest rates started to rise to bring things back within the inflationary range. And we now sit on a roughly 11.75%. So what that's done in terms of the consumer expectation is that we're actually on a relative high. If we look at the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, we were largely above 12% consistently, touching on 25% uh, in, the, in the 80s. But we are only essentially 4.5% above what is uh, – sorry, we are 4.5% above the low of COVID. So what that's done is it's created an expectation for consumers that if they, like a lot of people, bought a home uh, in COVID, they are now – paying 4.5% more on the interest rate, um, it's created an expectation that interest rates can head down there again. Uh, that may not yeah. be a risk realistic going down to 7%, but there's an expectation that if you bought at 7%, it should return there at some point. And so, so we're, seeing a, we're seeing the start of a downward cycle, which is fantastic for the economy. It's fantastic for buying. Um, and that cycle generally does trend for a number of years in that direction. So I think... To answer your question, the, the expectation is that things are getting better and that things will get better for the consumer in terms of what they're paying towards their current home loans. And that's hugely important for the broader South African economy. If you look at it, uh, still uh, roughly 60% of GDP is driven through the consumer, through consumer spending, through um, how consumers feel about their primary asset, which is often their property. And if they're paying a little less through the interest rates on their mortgage, then they're spending that elsewhere in the economy as well, or maybe plowing it back into doing improvements on their property. All of this creates something of a virtuous cycle. So we, we really can't um, stress enough how important interest rates are 
and uh, and uh, in South Africa, the expectation is certainly, as you say, for for them to come down. I agree with you. I don't think coming back down to seven percent is based in in reality. That that was an extraordinary situation with COVID. If you look at the banking sector. It's now looking at this has been heavily improved by technology, but there is still some legacy, what they call IT spaghetti systems in there, but they, they are improving. What do you see as the key technologies that are transforming the bank's ability to offer superior property financing products in a way that can um, help smooth this whole process for consumers and offer them a better deal at the end of the day? Yeah, so, so Michael, we've been... We've been servicing the home loan sector for about 25 years now as E4. And when we first came on the scene, the, the home loan process in terms of the fulfillment of a home loan was completely paper-based. Um, and what I mean by paper-based was that when banks would issue an instruction to, a, to an attorney, they would draft documentation, they would give it to a courier, that courier would drive to the attorney's office, deliver those papers, the attorney would unpack those papers, they would send documents back to the bank. And, and it, it, it's only 25 years ago, but it sounds like I can see by your response quite comical that we were, you know, we were operating like that. And so, so what we started doing was we were the first digital exchange for home loan instructions in South Africa uh, and, and possibly the world. Uh, so we would send, we took that paper based instruction and digitized it and were able to deliver that through secure encrypted channels with a public key infrastructure to attorneys around the country. And so we became the first home loan switch and that immediately uh, started the process of digitizing the home loan process in that instructions were then issued digitally. And then after that, some 25 years later, now the process is, uh, I would say, 98% digital in that uh, if you've bought a home in the last uh, let's say five years, there's a good chance that you've signed for that home loan digitally or electronically on a Wacom pad. Um, and then those documents remain digital. Um, and the, uh, that just lends, leads to much faster processing of, processing of documentation and much faster compliance on the bank side when those documents come back in. Um, so pretty much all the home loans in the country now are signed electronically. Um, and some of the tech we've recently deployed is the ability to, once those electronic documents come back into the banking system, our tech extracts the data from those documents and compares that data to the source data to verify that nothing has changed with regard to that uh, the original instruction on that home loan. And all of these things that we're putting in place are speeding up the time to register. And, and why that's important is that it takes roughly... Uh, let's say 60 days on average for a home loan to register in South Africa. And when we did the calculations um, for some of the major banks, every day of every day extra towards the registration accounts for roughly 12 million Rand in interest that the bank is losing out on in terms of early revenue recognition. So the exciting thing is we have 60 days to play with to reduce the time to register. And there, there are a number of things, obviously, that, that play a part in that. But through digitization, we could rapidly improve the time to uh, to fulfill a home loan. And of course, the, the, the next thing is then obviously looking at the front end, which is the onboarding process where, uh, if I recall, when I bought my first home, I think I waited five days for an indicative rate from the bank. And nowadays, that's just unacceptable. You know, nowadays with technology, you should be getting those rates within minutes potentially. Um, and, and a lot of the technology and services are available to do that rather rapidly nowadays. Now, that was certainly my experience recently with, with purchasing an investment property, you sit, sitting down with a conveyancing attorney, as you say, filling everything out uh, on a, on a, um, you know, on an iPad, basically, and uh, then the documents signed digitally and, and emailed to you and almost instantaneously. Obviously, you can't control what happens at the deeds office. And uh, much like the master's office as well, there's a lot of work that needs to go in there. But there is obviously still room for improvement in those controllables. Uh, and a remarkable stat that 12 million a day in, in, in lost um, uh, revenue. Given the sheer number of banks and FSPs in South Africa, obviously there's lots of competition for, for home loan and property financing market share. Um, the likes of Capitec, I think, recently now entering the market as well. What are the key areas where you see banks currently competing 
when things seem to have become commodified to a certain extent? And what are the opportunities still available for banks to differentiate themselves in a space that has become fairly commodified? Yes. Yeah, so, so, Michael, I think I think it's early days as far as competition goes with South African home loan banks. And, and I say that because there are traditionally six home loan banks of, of, of decent size in South Africa. And so there's traditionally been a lot of loyalty to those banks. So there hasn't been a demand, I think, from consumers to push the envelope in terms of competitive rates and how they can be serviced. You traditionally, when you, when you took out a home loan in the past, you would look at where you've got your savings account or your credit card and you'd go to, to that bank and expect that bank to service you with the best possible service and best possible rate. And so what we've seen over the last while is uh, what I'm calling the emergent lenders or the emergent home loan lenders that have really come to uh, ruffle the feathers of the home loan space and started to uh, move down the path of gamifying your home loan rates. Um, and I call it gamifying in particular because of one of the emergent lenders that is that is quite good in this space. Um, you'll know them as Discovery um, and the other the others like Capitec as well that are starting to look at different ways of uh, settling on a rate to entice a customer to move their home loan over, which we call bond switching. Um, and it's largely based on their, their model of uh, you, you live healthier, you, uh, you've got a healthier lifestyle, your interest rate will be better the more you are invested with the bank. They're starting to see that rate is more something they could play with in order to entice the customer across. Now, um, you know, Discovery offers up to 1%. And, and they, they reckon that 60% of all the home loans right now are overvalued. Um, you know, that 1%, if you dig into the detail, uh, there's a lot of detail behind it. There's 0.25 for this and 0.125 for that. And so uh, realistically, I think to get up to a 1% reduction is um, is difficult. Um, but, you know, the, the reduction is, is quite substantial. If, if you, for example, took a 2 million rand home loan, I've just got some notes here, a 2 million rand home loan, uh, since COVID, you'd be paying 6,200 Rand a month extra. So since the low of 75, uh, 7%, you'll now be paying an additional 6,200 Rand a month. And that 1% reduction would account for 1,400 Rand per month saving. If you had a, a 5 million Rand home loan, that would be an additional 15,000 Rand since COVID. Uh, your 1% would equate to a 3,500 Rand saving a month. So, it's very enticing. Uh, I think consumers are stretched. And so uh, the ability to now look at competitive rates, I think, is at a level it hasn't been in the past. And consumers are expecting that. And so with digitization, with looking at a better client's experience through digital platforms, through mobile platforms, uh, I think the banks are really starting to look at their, their CX, their client experience, how that it could, they could entice customers over to an always-on platform experience, um, and then also giving those competitive rates real-time. You know, nowadays, it's very easy to pick the good debt. We have uh, our sister company, Searchworks, is the largest aggregator of credit data in South Africa. And it's very easy now to tell whether a consumer is a, a good debtor um, and also very easy to get valuations on property through historical data, etc., so picking the good debt, you, there's no reason why banks can't give a competitive preferential rate within minutes as opposed to the five yeah. days I referred to earlier. Yeah, uh, and and if you're a low risk um, uh, client uh, through through that data vetting process, then it would be silly not to try and entice that customer over. And I don't know how many people would say no to an extra thirty to fifty thousand rand a year cumulatively, uh, just because they've switched their bond. But I still get the sense that you might look at the process and think, oh. Switching a bond, I had to sign so many documents when I first, uh, you know, acquired this this property. There's a lot of friction in that process. How is technology being used to make this a more seamless process? Yeah, so so, so Michael, you would think that bond switching was common, um, and in fact, in South Africa, it's very uncommon. And and when we look internationally at what's happening, uh, specifically in the UK, a uh, home loan would be switched three to four times over the lifespan of a bond, where in South Africa, traditionally, it's a 20-year commitment. 
uh, and you stick it out with your with your bank of choice uh, as a as a loyal customer. And so we see now that in South Africa that that UK model of bond switching is becoming a lot more prevalent, um, oh. or at least there's signs of it through these emergent lenders. Obviously, there are barriers, and and some of those barriers are. Um, not only high banking costs, which are unlike European and American economies, but also the high cost of switching a bond, uh, which involves registration fees, uh, conveyancing fees, banking fees. So there are a number of hurdles to get over. Um, and so your interest rate reduction for a switch needs to be substantially enough to off- offset those fees. Now, some of the banks are delaying those fees or absorbing those fees or capitalizing those fees. Uh, but you've still got to do your calculations um, so that uh, you are, in fact, saving the amount you expect. Um, but I think also, you know, it also comes down to the banking platform. And customers, I think, like to have their eggs in one basket uh, in terms of having a holistic experience around their finances and then being able to benefit from rewards programs, etc. But the interest rate is starting to challenge that, um, that eggs in one basket kind of thinking. Uh, but also I think customers are then willing to switch their bank based on a decent home rate because times are, are, are relatively tough and uh, consumers are stretched. Uh, you know, consumers would expect, well, would, consumers would likely move to a, um, to a banking platform that's different to their traditional one in order to benefit from those uh, reduction in monthly costs. Yeah, it's good old healthy competition and it's good for the consumer at the end of the day. Um, and nice to see that some of those uh, traditional barriers are, are coming down. If you look and you've mentioned the UK, but when you look at the global property financing markets, which I'm sure you survey to see, you know, where where there's innovation, what is best practice, what's coming down the pipe potentially, what lessons can local banks learn to improve how they serve South African clients? Yeah, Michael, interesting question. You know, I I think we often have this narrative as South Africans that we need to learn from the international community around how to do things. And I think one thing South Africa's um, been known for, in certain circles, of course, is that we have a very robust property transfer process with our South African deeds office. Um, mm-hmm. Although our property transfer process has been paper-based for the longest time, it's incredibly good in terms of the protection for the consumer and, uh, and, it's, and it's processing. And the, the surety one has over your title deed, um, we actually have a very advanced property transfer process. The only downside is it's been paper-based. Um, and so what we, what we are learning from what's happening overseas, and I know the deeds office is busy with a program to uh, dematerialize the deeds office. And what they mean by dematerialize is to move from a paper-based system to a either digital paper or non-paper. And it remains to be seen ultimately what route they're going to take. Uh, you know, there, there are systems in, uh, in Portugal and the Netherlands where there aren't documents involved in the process at all. It's more of a digital form, checkbox, click button kind of environment. Um, but we, we expect them and, and all indications are that they are going to remain to use documents but to use digital documents. And fortunately, in the, in the private sector, as I said, that process is 95% digital already. And so we're seeing that the deeds office is, is going to be digitized more, which is the last remaining hurdle to making uh, what is already a world-class paper-based system now a world-class digital system. Um, but I think then, you know, in, in terms of the banks, a lot of it comes down to how quickly they can onboard customers, how quickly they can give preferential rates, and then how quickly they can fulfill that customer's home loan. Um, and, and once again, you know, I think we we have something we can actually export to the world. And in fact, E4, E4 UK has started up for that very purpose, that we could take South African tech and deploy it in the UK and start to look at UK and European markets in the same way. Uh, I love that. Uh, there are areas where sometimes we are, uh, we, we tend to be too self-deprecating and we can innovate, we can lead the world. Hello, Vietni, but uns Vietni, Mar. Hello, Beken, no. Uh, what are, if you look at the big trends coming down the pipe, you know, a personal bugbear of mine is estate agents' commissions. And I've, I've bought and sold a few properties in my lifetime. And for the value added, 
versus the commission gained or charged, I think there's a there's a big delta there. And and there's clearly, you know, some competitive forces through technology that can be brought to bear on the process to to shift that into what is something a little bit more equitable. What what do you see as the next next big trends and maybe technologies that you're tracking moving forward in the space? Yeah, so so Michael, the the estate agent space is a bit out of my um, out of my expertise, but I, I would say this that I think trying to market one's home oneself is an incredibly difficult uh, exercise, and I think you know the estate agents definitely have their place in terms of using digital platforms to reach customers. Uh, although we have the big platforms like Property Twenty Four and Private Property and the like. Um, still often you need that estate agent touch that engages with the customer to sell the home. And we've looked, we've seen models like uh, a lead home, for example, that have come out with reduced fixed uh, estate agent fees. And, you know, maybe that, that is part of the way to go, looking at how they could have uh, area professionals that then are on a fixed fee basis for a particular suburb. That's an interesting model. Um, but I think, you know, on, on, on the other tech side, we obviously spoke about the digitization of the deeds office, which is going to to change things in terms of speed to register. Um, I think also one of the trends in terms of trying to house the nation and make home ownership accessible are things like fractional ownership. Uh, one of the banks has called it uh, collective buying, uh, similar to a Stockfell kind of concept where together with the number of family members or friends, you're able to come together and purchase a property. Um, obviously, that has that has challenges in terms of surety uh, over if one of those parties default on payments. You know, what does that look like in terms of how it's registered in the deeds office? Um, but I think that, that kind of concept is, is one of the things we're going to see that becomes more popular um, so that collectively family or friend can join together to, to get a title deed over property because obviously that title deed is empowering because that title deed... Uh, speaks to your credibility and can be used as collateral. Um, and then I think also um, the we're looking at a digital title deed coming out of the, de- the deeds office, which is going to be interesting. Um, you know, there, there's a sense that uh, having a piece of paper has a lot of security to it. I've got my piece of paper which says this is my title deed. But, um, you know, issuing a digital title deed in South Africa is kind of um, – geographic is is going to be an interesting trend to see is having a qr code on your phone that says you own a property is that going to give you sufficient comfort that uh, that property is indeed yours um we don't know we'll have to see uh, but then i think also in terms of um ai and contracting uh we also going to see um rapid document generation through um through ai and machine learning on how banks structure a home loan so that uh, deals can be uh, established a lot quicker. Um, and so I see a lot of, lot around the document contracting space where AI is going to play, going to play a role. Um, and then lastly, you know, data is often a predictor of the future. And uh, nowadays, having digitized the home loan space in the last 25 years, uh, we sit on incredible data that can be used to predict good clients versus bad clients and and so we should see a lot of optimization and a lot of uh, automation in the home loan space as, as banks are quickly able to pick up good creditors, uh, good debtors. Um, but then also in the bond switching space, they're able to identify good debtors to entice over to, um, to their own mm. banking platform. So I think it's going mm. to hot up. I think we're going to see a lot more transactions happening uh, over the lifespan of a bond. And uh, it's going to be a lot more dynamic. Costs will obviously come down. And that ultimately makes it accessible for more South Africans to purchase a home. Yeah, that to me, and you mentioned discovery earlier, that is shared value when you have all of these competitive forces leading to a more efficient ecosystem, one that's driving down costs. Uh, and ensuring you achieve some of these outcomes. Uh, very interesting uh, regarding the fractional ownership and obviously the Hernan de Soto model of, of title deeds unlocking that latent potential in um, in the base of the pyramid in South Africa. I think that's uh, fascinating. Clive, thanks for sharing great insights into how tech is transforming the property financing landscape here on Business Talk. Take care. Thanks, Michael. Good to chat.